Well, hello, graduating seniors, Mr. and Mrs. America, and all the ships at sea. We have arrived, albeit virtually, at Graduate Sunday. How do you like my costume? I wasn't sure I was going to carry on the tradition Glenn started of dressing up in costume for Graduate Sunday. Glenn is, after all, a much bigger ham than I am. You know you are, Etheridge. But as I was meeting the congregation in small groups and class meetings, I met with representatives of the youth group, and they told me about the traditions in the youth group and how important they are to you. One of the youth group members, Ramona Benefield, made a point of coming up to me after a small group meeting in her home was ending to ask me specifically if the Graduate Sunday tradition would be continuing. I said, sure, without my knowing how truly non-traditional it would be, how unlike Graduate Sundays in the past. So much of this Sunday is not at all like earlier graduation Sundays, but I knew I could make one thing be like it had always been. So behold, the senior pastor is wearing a ridiculous getup. For you, graduating seniors, only for you. So have you guessed who I'm dressed up as? If you guessed Susan Sorority from The Silent Majority, you're pretty close. Ask your grandparents about that spot-on cultural reference. She was a character Lily Tomlin played on a little show called Laugh-In. You know Lily Tomlin, the lady from Grace and Frankie. Anyway, if you guessed Cher, whom you may have seen playing the grandmother in the second Mamma Mia film, if you guessed Cher, thank you. But no, this getup, the embroidered shirt, the blue jeans, the strappy sandals, the long straight hair, the face devoid of makeup, the earrings, the schmata. This is me, high school graduate me from way back in 1977. I don't do math in my head, so have your parents get out their abacus or their slide rule and tell you how many years ago that was. But this was me. I played the cello in the orchestra, I sang in the chorus, I went on church youth choir tour. But most of the time, when I wasn't barely passing in math class, I was hanging out in, wait for it, the drama department. I was in every play, every musical, every one-act play competition ever entered by Cedar Shoals High School over in Athens. Most days after school, most weekends during the school year, several summers were spent at music or drama events. I wasn't one of the smart kids. I wasn't one of the cool kids. I was one of the artsy-fartsy kids. I even went back to my high school drama club meeting years after graduating to show them what it looked like to make a career out of dressing up in costumes and telling stories to large crowds of people. It helps if the stories are funny. And at every drama club event and play and competition, there in the crowd with me were my best friends. Kathy Kennan, who's a cousin of Miss Billy Carroll, who sings in the Oak Grove Chancel Choir, who became my best friend in sixth grade and who remains my best friend to this day. And my other best friend, Scott Lago, whom I met in ninth grade because we were seated next to each other in typing class where the seating was ranked alphabetically. So Lago sat next to LaRocca in the class. Kathy, Scott, and I were virtually inseparable. The two of them even went off to Young Harris College together after graduation while I headed off to Duke. But being apart in college did not change who we were to each other. Scott once embarked on a grueling 14-hour bus ride to come visit me in Durham. It made for one very hilarious story, which he told for years afterward. As for Kathy, I performed her wedding to her husband, Gary, and I'm the godmother to her daughter, Abigail. High school was a turbulent time for me, as I'm sure it has been for you. And there were things waiting for me in the near future that I had no idea were headed my way, as I'm sure you had no idea that a pandemic was going to shut down your senior year and do away with so many things that you had been looking forward to. 
There were no major political upheavals during my high school years. No wars, no nuclear holocausts, no epidemics. The wave of assassinations that claimed Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Medgar Evers and John and Bobby Kennedy happened when I was in elementary school. I've often told the story about how my first African-American teacher in elementary school was Mrs. Woods, who pulled a television cart into our fourth grade classroom so we could watch the broadcast of Dr. King's funeral procession. It was not lost on me that 40 years later, I sat cross-legged on the floor with my kids, Ellie and Joe, and their fourth grade classmates as the smart board in the front of the room displayed the broadcast of the inauguration of Barack Obama. I have often marveled at how things have changed from my fourth grade year to theirs. But getting back to high school, assassinations seemed to have ceased by then. There were no active wars going on either. Vietnam had ended when I was in middle school. But there was something unexpected on the horizon. The AIDS pandemic that would claim the lives of my church youth choir director, my college choir director, and six of my friends from the Cedar Shoals High School Drama Club, including Scott. This began when we were in college. The search for the drugs that would keep infected people alive took 10 years. No vaccine even now exists. But if Scott had lived just another six months, the protease inhibitor cocktail that succeeded in keeping most AIDS patients alive could have saved him too, and he would be alive today. Ironically, I can remember clear as day watching one Dr. Anthony Fauci speak about this virtual cure for AIDS on the television news about six months after Scott died. I knew I should have been happy about how many people it would save. But four words just kept running through my head over and over and over again. Too late for us. Too late for us. A week before, he was to be a groomsman in my wedding, the wedding in which Kathy was the matron of honor. Mark and I flew out to San Francisco so I could conduct Scott's funeral. It was not what we had expected. It was not what anyone had expected. It robbed us of so many things, so many happy things we had been anticipating. Life will do that. Life is doing that right now, throwing things at us that we had not expected and which we are not ready for. But while the girl with the long black hair could not possibly know what strange and sad things were coming her way, this old lady with the short gray hair has some good news to share with you, class of 2020. We may not be given the ability to know what is going to happen to us in this life, but one thing we do know, God is in the midst of everything that is happening. God is all around you in the world, and God will shield you. God will help you rise to every occasion and meet every challenge. All those things you face where your first thought is, I can't do this, I'm not smart enough, I'm not strong enough. In all of those times, remember what Jesus said in the passage we heard for this morning. In it, Jesus prays to the Father specifically for you and for me and all those of us who are alive in this world and believe in him. He prays these words to the Father for you and all of us. He said, Father, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from this world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm asking on their behalf because they are yours. Now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. Holy Father, protect them. Protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. God's protection bestowed upon you by our Lord will go with you wherever life takes you. God will infuse your life with direction and meaning as you find your way in the world. 
even the sorrowful things that happen to you, will be transformed by God into the most important work you will do in life. I didn't know in high school that the love I had for my best friend Scott would put my feet on the path to become an activist for social justice for a community I was not even really a part of. The sorrow of losing him made me love all others who were in any way like him and to feel their struggle as my own. It is not only the joyful milestones that make us who we are. When God infuses all of your life, every sadness as well as every joy lights up the path before you and leads you to the work God is giving you to do. Jesus said of his own life, Lord God, I glorify you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. Now that you have graduated from high school, God is preparing a way for you into the work that he has for you to do. You may not know what that work is, but God knows what it is, and God is preparing the way for you. Every experience that you have had from the day you were born until now has formed you into the person you are and has begun your transition into the person you will become. It is often said to youth in the church, Oh, you're important to us because you are our future. But I am here to say to you today that this is a lie. You are not our future. You are our now. You are the church of Jesus Christ that is and that in the future will be. Our future doesn't rest with you. Our future rests in you. If the church is to rise up to meet this new age, if we are to be a force for good in the world, if we are to change the church so that our human sin does not permeate our structures and our practices and our beliefs, it is you who will make that so. Not in some shiny future age, but now. Christ has given you this blessing, this prayer of protection from Almighty God. Great things lie ahead for each of you. Great things, terrible things, wonderful things. Your years of learning at home are ending. Soon you will move out into this world. And wherever you go, God will be with you. So now, class of 2020, now to work. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.